Hello, my name's Mark Hammond and I'm a visiting fellow here at Bath at the Centre for the Analysis of Social Policy. I'm going to talk to this morning about social policy and climate change. Uh, and while I'm talking about climate change, it's because a long time ago now, perhaps 30 years ago, I was one of the first people recruited into the British Civil Service to deal with climate change, heading up what was called in 1989 the International Branch. In particular, I was responsible for the negotiations that took place to produce the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that was signed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. I'm going to talk in the second part of this lecture about those negotiations and the social policy issues that underlie them, but I'm going to begin by talking more broadly about the background to environmental issues and international action uh, over the years leading up to the period when climate change became a major topic. Obviously climate change wasn't the first environmental issue that came to prominence and where the public was looking for action. And it wasn't the first time that international action was needed where countries worked together. The significant difference, as we'll talk about, is the extent to which all of the economy and society, particularly of the developed world, was so dependent on fossil fuels the major source of emissions of carbon dioxide that contributes to climate change. So unlike some of the earlier issues that we'll touch upon as we go through the talk, climate change has been more difficult, more controversial to tackle because of the extent to which it demands that our economy and society are restructured and that we adopt different social policies to drive the economy. Going back to some of the origins around international environment issues and actions, you could start in many places. In the UK, you could start with the 1853 Smoke Nuisance Act at a time in the Victorian age when homes were largely heated and cooking took place with wood and coal. But I think the place I'm going to start is the 1972 United Nations Stockholm Environment Conference. This was really the first time the United Nations had convened an environmental conference at head of government level, presidents and prime ministers. For many politicians, and perhaps for most people around the world, the environment at that stage was still a fringe issue. In the United Nations system, the group of 77, so-called because there were originally 77 countries in it, although by this stage it had grown considerably, were very much more concerned and focused on development. These were what were known previously as, as the less developed countries, or least developed countries in some cases. And clearly their national priorities at the time in 1972 were very much focused on development rather than being concerned about what was seen in some quarters as, as the luxury concerns of the developed West. We also at that stage still had the Warsaw Pact countries, what were also known as the Second World, deeply suspicious of course of everything that came from the West, at times seeing environmental problems as the consequence of capitalism, which would never of course occur in a good Marxist-Leninist country. We of course now know that in places like East Germany and some other of the you know, Warsaw Pact countries, environmental issues were so far ignored that the impacts were far worse than we'd seen in many of the Western European democracies. But in 1972, environmental impacts had started to become much more visible in many parts of the world, in many countries. And rather than just dealing, for example, with endangered species, the adverse impacts and causes of environmental damage and concerns lay in social and economic policies that were much closer to home for many people and many countries. There were a whole set of different problems and concerns that were highlighted at the Stockholm Conference. There was a considerable row between Sweden and the United Kingdom about what was called acid rain, and we'll talk about this in more detail shortly. There was a great concern about deforestation in Brazil, which of course is still a huge concern today. And the rest of the world felt deeply concerned about the, the actions Brazil was allowing to take place in the Amazon basin and in the great rainforests of Brazil. At that stage, believe it or not, there was still atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, particularly by France, 
in what were seen as their possessions in the Pacific. And this pitched the French into a very strident battle, particularly with countries like New Zealand. The UK and France were allies uh, against the Scandinavian countries and some others who objected to Concorde, the Anglo-French supersonic airliner, because they felt it was having damaging effects in the ozone layer and parts of the atmosphere. So many different countries had many different interests that were in play in and around the Stockholm discussions. But there were also some general issues that were starting to come to the fore that would be much more important in, in the decades that followed. There was starting to be concern about global population and the pressures that overpopulation could bring on a fragile environment. This led to discussions around ideas of limits to growth, the notion that there had to be some cap on the amount of development that could take place globally that the atmosphere, the seas, the land could cope with. And inevitably that meant that the discussions governments, prime ministers, presidents were having in Stockholm were not arbitrary or they had real effects on people's lives across the board. Because if action was going to be taken to limit growth, to limit development, to limit industrialization, then this would have real and tangible impacts on thousands of people globally. And at that stage, ideas were beginning to come forward for the first time that we now take for granted. For example, the idea that the polluter pays. Essentially, that if a company produces a product which at the end of its life or in its use causes significant environmental damage or which the state has to pick up a huge cost for disposing of at the end of its use, then those costs should be factored into how much one has to pay for the product in the first place. Lifetime costs were an important element, therefore, in, in assessing what the actual impact of anything should be on the environment in the longer run. And that meant as well starting to assess what environmental impacts would be at a distance, not just in the local environment where the product might have been bought or consumed. But while in countries in Scandinavia and in Western Europe some of these ideas were being developed and taken on board, for many countries such as the G77 who were just starting to industrialise, often with high populations with huge development needs, the priorities were naturally very different. And of course, within the G77, they were by no means a homogeneous set of countries. They included countries like Brazil, China, India, those that were beginning to develop significant industrial bases. But they also included small Pacific islands, many countries across sub-Saharan Africa, who were in a very different position from their larger neighbours. And across Western Europe, the dependence on fossil fuels in generating coal for electricity and domestic heating remained almost absolute. It was certainly still the case in the UK long past 1972. And in the UK, just for once perhaps, we tended to see ourselves as isolated from some of the problems of mainland Europe. As an island, as we were not connected in the same way to river courses or some of the land pollution issues, we had been able to stand back and not see the same issues arising in the UK as countries with land borders, as countries where rivers flowed across borders, uh, had had to face up to for many more years. But that period of isolation, politically and geographically, was beginning to come to an end. So through the 1970s and the 1980s, the UK, unfortunately, was often seen as the dirty man of Europe, a name that our neighbours unfortunately coined for us. We still had some very poor national habits, driven, however, by the fact that we were able to not have the costs of dealing with environmental problems properly integrated into what people were prepared to pay. So, for example, Rather than paying for managing, recycling and disposing of our household and other waste properly, it was simply dumped in containers at sea. 
with no real regard for the impacts that might be having. As we still burnt a huge amount of coal to supply electricity across the country for homes and businesses, the sulphur emissions from those that burning of coal was creating acid rain, which, because of the westerly prevailing winds, did not fall on the UK, but on our European neighbours, particularly in Scandinavia. And in the UK in general, we had relatively poor air quality, again partly driven by the burning of, of coal and solid fuels for home heating, and water quality was very poor in many of our rivers. At that stage, in the early 1970s and, and into the 1980s, it simply wasn't seen as a priority issue. But we were beginning to have to confront the fact that there are long-term choices to have the economic and social policies which did not leave the costs of cleaning up behind us to the next generations and beyond. We needed to manage our waste locally, we needed to encourage energy efficiency, and we needed to look at the way things like petrol prices drove demand and supply. But politically it was very difficult at that stage to move from not asking people to integrate environmental cost into what they do and how they did it. Much has moved on, a great deal has changed since that period. But in some ways there are of course still issues, and climate change as we'll come on to is one of them, where it's not clear that indeed we have persuaded everyone that the actions we take every day, the social policies we adopt, should have the environmental costs properly built in to what we do. Acid rain is a very good example of an early environmental issue and it's worth pausing here for a moment to talk about how it developed and what the response was to it. So back in 1979 the Long Range Convention on Transboundary Air Pollution, as it was called, started concerted European action to reduce the emissions of sulphur dioxide from burning coal and other fuels that was driving acid rain, that is to say, obviously, rain that because of the acidic nature of the emissions into the atmosphere was falling on grounds, turning water acidic, damaging trees and, and other shrubs and flowers, and falling largely because of the prevailing winds on different countries from those who were generating the emissions in the first place. But unfortunately, back in 1979, the UK government took the view that it didn't entirely believe the science that lay behind the acid rain problem. So for several years, we were very much isolated among Eurus and European countries in not being willing to take drastic and important and early action to tackle the problem. In 1985, many countries adopted what was called the 30% Club, that is a commitment to reduce sulphur emissions by 30% over the coming years. At that stage, the UK simply didn't take part in that commitment. And it took another three years to 1988, when there was an EU direct issue, before the UK was with economic policy. 